All right, welcome everybody, everyone back to the second session. And what we're going to be talking about is how did God set it up so that he can forgive us? Have you ever thought about why hasn't God forgiven the whole world? I mean, if, if forgiveness comes through Jesus Christ, and it isn't because of anything that we particularly did, why doesn't he just forgive everybody? Would make sense, mm -hmm. right? Well, it does until you realize that you have to participate. There's a, there's a point of your involvement that you are, uh, it's necessary for you to do, especially one thing. And we often refer to Romans 10, 9, and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved, right? All right, so with that, we help people understand that they need to confess Jesus as Lord and they need to believe that God raised him from the dead. What are we doing when we confess Jesus as Lord? We're repenting of me being Lord. I'm not, I'm saying that I am no longer Lord of my life. Jesus Christ is now my Lord. As long as we try to do that which the adversary lie is, is that, you know, I will be as God, then I will never need, in my heart, need to repent of that. If I truly believe that lie, I'll never repent. But when I come to the conclusion that I need a Savior, I need the Lord Jesus Christ, and I am making him Lord, then is when the salvation can happen. And we go back to uh, the very first sermon on the day of Pentecost, when Peter was describing what they needed to do in order to be saved. Now let's look at uh, Acts chapter 2, we'll start in verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and and Christ. Well, there wasn't any soft soaping wet, was he? You crucified him. And that one you crucified, God has made both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts. Said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Now, this whole speech, this whole teaching was inspired by God. And God very specifically said for them to do this. And Peter said unto them, repent. Repent. And be baptized. Now, we know from Scripture buildup that there is a difference between this baptism and the baptism of John, because Jesus Christ himself said in the previous chapter that John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with Holy Spirit. That indicates there's a change. The change was baptism of Holy Spirit is now the superior to baptism with water. I was baptized in water when I was 12 years old. <laughs> went to the Emmanuel Baptist Church. Didn't harm me, but it certainly didn't. I didn't come out of the water speaking in tongues. Right. Okay. I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord, but I did, that's all I knew. And that's what Apollos was. Remember, he was kind of handicapped by saying it was said that he only knew the baptism of John. It was when he was instructed more perfectly by Aquila and Priscilla that there was a baptism greater. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He's talking about being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission. Remission is the same word 
in Greek as forgiveness. So when you read remission, you can replace it with forgiveness of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of Holy Ghost. There are differences of administrations in the Bible. Administrations, we understand politically, when one president takes over, there's changes from what the previous presidents did. And some of them are, the things are still being held the same way because of the laws of land. But there's other things that are being done different because of his executive powers. Well, with God, it's the same kind of idea in that there are many things that are carried through from one administration to the other. But there's also some dramatic changes in how he relates or works with his people. Because when somebody has now had the gift of Holy Spirit, there is a way of communicating directly with them that wasn't available before. Not on a wholesale uh, group like it is now, where everybody who's a Christian has Holy Spirit. Before the day of Pentecost, there were men and women who had Holy Spirit, and everybody else better be listening to them because that's God's voice. That was how God communicated with his people was through men and women who had Holy Spirit. But all of those times it was upon condition. And what I mean by condition is that they were in a place and had a job that was for a purpose for a sometimes unlimited time. And when those conditions changed, they didn't need Holy Spirit anymore. It was taken away. If you remember back to Samson, remember he had the Holy Spirit for a while, and then he, he sinned, and the Holy Spirit was, was removed, but then it came back on when he repented. So the point is, is that now, at this time, the Holy Spirit came as a condition of repentance. First thing they had to do was repent. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So they were, uh, their vision was being lifted now. It isn't just to Israel. As many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. There's a warning. There is a way of life that Christianity gives us, a way of living, of treating each other. As a matter of fact, the world will know you by your love. That's how they'll know you. It isn't by many things that we are known in the world as Christians. And God says, They'll know us by our love. That's pretty cool. And so when we are not loving, how does the world know that we're any different from them? It doesn't. It doesn't. You're just one of the guys that, uh, that are among many. But that, that statement is true today as it is ever has been. Save yourself from this untoward generation. The adversary is the God of this world. He's declared to be the God of this world. He's not a God, but it's a figure. It's, he has a lot of power. And he also has a lot of control over the nations and the rulers of the nations. So if we live in a nation whose uh, the adversary has affected a lot, does that mean that we cannot be good practicing Christians, even though we live in a pretty bad neighborhood, so to speak? Absolutely not. The word is not written to people in the United States alone. All right? It's, word, it's written to all Christians. And as I have had the privilege of going to other countries and seeing how people are trying to uh, live their Christianity in a communist country, they have much greater challenges doing it than we do here. 
<clears throat> I made several trips to the country of Venezuela, and I've seen their country go progressively more and more communist. And right now, it's difficult to even keep body and soul together for the believers. They, uh, they can't go anywhere, and if they can go someplace, they uh, don't have the gas to get there. Because even the, the oil-rich country that they are, they don't know how to produce the gasoline from the oil because they kicked out all the people that know how to. So when something breaks, they don't know how to fix it. But the point is, is that the believers are not slowed down one bit. Matter of fact, the word is moving even greater because the need is so much more obvious. But in those, in many, many countries, the adversary is able to be more bold because of circumstances. In Venezuela, they have cults that worship uh, witches. They call them brujas. Yeah. And uh, one of the times I was there, uh, the leader, Juan Cabrera, wanted to take me to uh, Witch Mountain. <laughs> he, he's, yeah, I, I don't know what they call it, but there's a cult that worships uh, this one Indian princess that rides on the back of a turtle. I don't know. It's crazy. But at this one mountain, they have seven different layers or, or levels up the mountain. And the higher you go, the more crazy it gets. And at the fourth level, they levitate. The priests actually lift up off the ground. Um, these are lying signs and wonders. But the thing is, is that people see this and they think that there's power there, godly power there. And so they worship it. And that there was lying signs and wonders by magicians and those kind of guys when Jesus Christ was there. Lying signs and wonders is not new. But the point is, is that we need to isolate ourselves in our thinking from what the adversary wants us to get discouraged by. Verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were, what? Baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about how many? 3,000 souls. Well, that must have been one heck of a tent meeting. And everybody went down to the river and got baptized. <laughs> No, no, they all accepted the Holy Spirit. They all received the Holy Spirit by accepting Jesus Christ. You know what? I bet they all did. I bet they manifest. That's how they know. That's how you know. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. If you want to grow fast and go far with God, this is a great way to do it. And fear or respect came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. Now, those are true wonders and signs, not the lying signs and wonders. There were about 3,000 souls added to the church that day on these instructions, repent and be baptized. This is the change that happens at the point of recognizing the offenses. Remember, they first were told, you crucified the Lord of glory. And they went, ah, we did. The Savior that we had been expecting, the Messiah that had been promised us, we killed. Can you imagine when you finally realized that you did that? how your heart would feel because they, they were all sincere. They all thought they were doing something for God by getting rid of this false Messiah. But when they finally realized it, that they had themselves crucified the Messiah, that they all wanted to come. They were pricked in their hearts. So, this is the change that happens at the point of recognizing the offenses, the helplessness, and the changing of our beliefs. It becomes real 
and it becomes dramatic. There can be no real change without repentance. And you notice I highlighted that. There can be no real change unless the repentance. We can say, I'm sorry. Gee, I'm sorry. But unless there's real repentance, there can be no real change. Because just by simply apologizing without there being a real heart change, I'll keep doing it. I'll keep doing the same mistake over and over again. So, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men, men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce, baker, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, I always get a tickle when I read it, <laughs> fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women, laden with sins, led away with divers lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. There will be no change until there's a repentance. And these were, quote, quote, men of God. Men and women of God who were supposed to be leading the church. Yet they and themselves had never really repented. Not of their old ways. <clears throat> Because all that just described was the old man nature. All of that is the old man nature that they were doing. People can go to church for a lifetime and never reach the place that repentance will take them in just an instant. The first step in any reconciliation starts with repentance. If you think you are right and do not need the gift of God, why would you ever acknowledge your need? Repentance is recognizing the need to change and accepting the gift of God because you need it and you want it. Deep down inside, every person has the need for a relationship like the one Adam lost. This is the intimate knowledge of God, your Father, who loves you and gave his Son for you. This reconciliation of the fellowship with your father is because of Jesus Christ and that he decided to lay down his life for you so that you could know God. Jesus Christ did this so that you could have a relationship with the father. That's the purpose. That was what it was in his heart so that you could have a relationship with the father. so that you could come to know the Father like he did. John 17, verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they may, they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. So when we are one with God, are we God? When we're one with Jesus Christ, are we Jesus Christ? But in the Spirit, because of the Spirit, we now have the ability to have fellowship with God. Do you see? We have fellowship with God. The same kind of fellowship that Jesus Christ did. 
And we all want to be able to talk to God like Jesus Christ did, right? And to know that he's talking back. That is the relationship that he has given us. That he has reestablished our fellowship with the Father. We live pretty far below that for most of us. I in them, verse 23, and thou in me, that they may be perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also, whom thou givest me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. All of this is because of the Holy Spirit that was given on the day of Pentecost and ever since then. Because of that Holy Spirit, we now have this intimacy available to us from God and to God. It's the simplicity that is in Christ. The goal and aim of every Christian is to have the kind of intimate relationship with the Father that Jesus Christ did. As we grow up in Christ, we find that there are times in our lives that we don't sense this. We, it's kind of hit and miss for us. But if we stay faithful and imitate our Father and follow after the example of our brother Jesus Christ, it becomes clearer and clearer of who and what God is to us. Repentance can be defined as to perceive with the mind and to change one's mind, to repent, to change one's mind for better, heartily to amend with abhorrence, abhorrence of one's past sins. That's repentance. It doesn't mean that you'll never do it again. Because old habits are sometimes hard to break, but they will never be broken until they're first rejected. If you think that what you're doing is not wrong, you'll continue doing it. But it's when you realize that it's wrong, and even then when you're ready to do it again, you go, no, no, that's not right. It's not a lackadaisical approach. It's an aggressive recognition of who we are before the Lord Jesus Christ, before he came into our lives. This sounds impossible to the average person, but still the purpose of Christ's life and the giving of it, it all starts with repentance. Matthew 9, verse 12. But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, they that be whole, whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. That's a perception of the individual, not the reality. If I think I'm good, I'm not going to seek a physician, am I? Right. It's when I think I'm sick that I seek a physician. Mm -hmm. So the Pharisees, the scribes, the, the priests, did they think that they were sick, that they needed a physician? No. It was the average person <laughs> that came to him by the thousands they realized that they were sick and they were not only sick physically and got healed they were sick of the heart this is where they were sick because they had no light of god's word for 400 years but go ye and learn what that meaneth i will have mercy and not sacrifice for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Again, perspective. 
do I believe I'm righteous like the Pharisees? Or do I believe I need a savior? Before we think that this is uh, only true for the Jews, the Gentiles also brought into the, uh, the equation here. Acts chapter 11, verse 16. Acts chapter 11, verse 16 says, Then remember I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Now here is Peter recounting to the church leaders how he had gone and witnessed to Cornelius, who was a Roman centurion, and by golly, as he was witnessing to them, they started speaking in tongues. The whole house full. And of course, this kind of surprised Peter because he, up until that point, he was getting his cobwebs shook loose by that lowering of the, uh, uh, the, the sheet with the unclean animals. You know, it was God kind of going, Peter, Peter, I got something new to give you. Because until that point, only the Jews were the ones for the Jews, Christianity and coming of Christ is simply a continuation of the old Mosaic law, except now we have the promised Messiah, and now we have Holy Spirit. You see, but they were still looking to the old Mosaic law for a lot of the things that they did. So now after that happened, Cornelius and his household were now speaking in tongues, they, uh, the people in the church at Jerusalem want to know what happened. See what he's recounting. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? No matter what my opinion was, I had to do what God wanted me to do. When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto the life. So repentance was important to the Gentiles as well. Romans chapter 2, verse 3. <clears throat> and thinkest thou this, O man, that judgeth them which do such things, and dost the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to what? Repentance. God wants us to realize that the things that we were engaging in had to be rejected. Romans eleven twenty nine, for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Now that's saying that God's never going to go back. He's never going to change his mind on the gifts that he's given and the callings that he's given. Isn't that great? He's never going to repent of the things he's done for us. You were chosen to be heirs of God and joint heirs of Christ. That's a choice God made because he loved you beyond anyone's ability to explain. If you were born again, if you are born again, you are now his family because of his divine nature in you, his spiritual seed, and he is not sorry that he did it. This is the message that God has tried to make clear to us, that we might be free from the sin of sin consciousness that was ours as a result of spiritual death, that we might joyfully take our place in the family as his dear sons and daughters, and that we might walk as fearlessly in the presence of sin and demons and disease and circumstances as Christ did himself. So forgiveness is actually a promise that God has given. In Psalm 103, verse 9, So God gave us promises to take our sins and not only lay it aside, but it cast it as far as away from us as to never be tempted to pick it up again. 
He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Do you realize that the word never says that God forgets your sins? God never forgets your sins. Never says that he does. Even though we attributed that to him. What it says is that he'll never recall them again. You see, forgiving or forgetting is an involuntary thing. Never bringing it up again is a decision. Because if God forgets people's sins once he's forgiven them, how would you know that David sinned? Okay. But the point is, it's not that God forgets our sins. It's that he's promised you he will never hold it to your account. It's, he lays it aside and promises you that he'll never hold that sin against you. I can never forgive somebody and say that I'm going to forget. Can you? Can you honestly proclaim that when you forgive somebody that you will forget it? Absolutely. And I, you'd be super person if you could. If you can absolutely promise me you're going to forget something. Because remember, forget, forgetting something is involuntary. The more you think about something, the less that you'll forget it. But the point is, now, the, as an example given to us from God, is that when we forgive somebody, what we're doing is, I'm promising I'm going to lay that aside, even if I remember it, I'll never hold it against you again. That's my decision. That's my promise. Oh, but do I ever get reminded of things I've done in the past? Sometimes I do. Well, you've done that before. <laughs> Especially, you know, with, and, and not that Debbie does that, but <laughs> I've experienced that before. Is that, you know, because I'm human and I, I will make the same mistakes over and over again, uh, it becomes cumulative in people's minds instead of once each time has to be addressed. Now it is not only do I need forgiveness for this one time, now I need to re-be forgiven all the other times. What we need to do is to practice. I'm going to forgive you and never hold it against you again. There might be other things I could, that will come up that need to be addressed. But when I forgive, I'll never bring it up again. That's the example we have in God. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. He's likening himself to a father's relationship to a child. How do we address things that our child, children do wrong? They're done, and you get over it. They're, they're addressed, and you just get on, on with things. The parent doesn't keep saying, well, when you were two, you crayon mark my wall. Now that you're 16, you're doing the same thing again. No, parents don't treat their children like do you know why? Because they see the child as he will be, not as he is. We see our children as mature adults living and being children of God. That's how we see them in our hearts. And so when we see people like that, then it's a lot easier to deal with the things that are happening at the moment. 
So God compares himself to earth, our earthly fathers, his love toward us. Fathers can see past the moment of rebellion in the now to the restoration that is in the future. That's how God sees us. You realize that God sees you as Christ made you? That's his vision of you. He's not interested in seeing your faults. He sees you as Christ has made you. All we have to do is for a moment live up to it. Just live up to it. Try it for a moment. See how it is. In Psalm 78, verse 38, but he being full of compassion forgave our iniquity. And you'll see many times compassion and forgiveness go hand in hand because compassion is the motivator to forgive. Forgave our iniquity and destroyed them not. Yea, many a time turned he his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath. Compassion is a great motivator to forgive. Compassion and forgiveness go hand in hand. Compassion gives reason for something so unreasonable to our mind. It is the love of God reaching out to someone in need of forgiveness. That's what compassion is. There's a need that you are reaching out to meet. meet. And in this particular case, it's not food. It's not healing, it's forgiveness. It's compassion reaches our heart out to do. At one time, the record was right there accusing us, exposing us, and proving that we were worthy of God's righteous anger against us. There was no escaping the debt. God is just and righteous and loving and gracious and merciful. The only way that he could extend all these things to us was the legal payment of the debt we owed. And that debt was paid for in full by Jesus Christ. If God is just, then we justly deserve punishment. But he's also loving and kind and forgiving. So how, did, how is he just and that? And the way that he is, is by providing us a way of escaping the justice. And he does it in Romans 3, 23. <clears throat> Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All right, guilty. Next case. That's what could have been done. Verse 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Justified is a legal term, right? It's a legal term. And if you go into a court of law, you are standing before the bar of justice with a judge. And in the courtroom, you have the accused, right? Let's put you in that position. You have the accuser or the prosecuting attorney. Let's put the devil in that position. And then you have the defense attorney or our advocate. Let's put Jesus Christ in that. And God is the judge. And the, the uh, prosecuting attorney, he's constantly saying all the things that we've done in our life. All, just like he did uh, go before God and he accused Job. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Look it up sometime. It's an interesting story. <laughs> but the point is, is that the adversary is always a, a great accuser. He's accusing us before God and before ourselves. He's constantly going to be reminding you of your past. Just to let you know that's coming. <laughs> then but what we have is a defense attorney. Now, we stand there already guilty. We're already guilty, according to, to verse 23, right? Mm -hmm. But our defense attorney does something that no defense attorney is ever going to do. He says, I'll pay the price. I'll pay the price. 
And so Jesus Christ paid the price. And because he paid the price, the debt was fulfilled. He looks at you and he says, son or daughter, what you are is acquitted. I give you a sentence of acquittal. Now, if you know any kind of legal terms, acquittal means it doesn't mean you, you didn't do it. It's just legally you're set free. Isn't that great? That's the courtroom scene that's being played out here. Verse 25, whom God has set to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. So when we believed in Jesus Christ, he became that payment, propitiation is payment. Because of, in his blood, that blood being the physical sacrifice that he did. To declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. God being the judge. To declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believe in Jesus. So God became the justice, the just and the justifier. Wow. Of anyone that believes on the name of Jesus Christ. So. Now the judge was, can be like Jesus Christ was when the lady came and thrown down in front of him. Where are thy accusers? None. None at all. So when we are acquitted by God, he has no legal right to ever bring it up again. That's what he promised. Nor does he wish to. It is over, done with, gone. None of this would have been possible if God arranged it, had not arranged it from the beginning and guarded it from the attacks of the enemy. The devil was trying to take out the bloodline of Jesus Christ from Adam. He was trying to take out the bloodline of Jesus Christ from ever uh, producing the Messiah. Forgiveness would not have been possible without our great defense attorney who gave his life in our place for our substitution. It is a simple thing to recognize the error, reject the past beliefs, and embrace the extended grace of God. Every effort of man to be spiritual in his own good works, his self-sacrifice, his own abilities, and his own unbelief falls short of the grace of God. God made a way where there was no way and made us able in Jesus Christ. God did not owe us anything, yet he loved us anyway. We owe him everything. So that's this session. So, questions? Sir, great. Up to the front. A big uh, part of the session was the promise of forgiveness. It's a promise. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, with every promise in God's word, it's available. So there's a condition that has to be met to receive that promise. Right. Availability. God makes a lot of promises available, including the promise of forgiveness. That's availability. But appropriation is our responsibility. We have to appropriate that promise with pure believing. Is that correct thinking? Yes, uh, and, and repentance is a step toward that belief. That's it. That's the first step you have to make. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, 
Yes. Come on. I don't really have a question. I just really love when you said compassion is the motivator to forgive. I just never looked at it that way before. That compassion is the motivator. It makes sense. Yeah, we're going to be getting later on in the class is the only way that forgiveness works or the the steps to forgiveness, the only way it works is if it's being motivated by love. And compassion is, you know, a, a way of loving. Okay, anybody else? Any on the Zoom calls? Which says the stripes going up and down makes me look thin. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Is it doing the trick? All right, yeah. Thumbs up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you got a question? I don't think it's even stripes. You're going to have to. Uh, an observation. As, as far as I had always wondered about the God's forgetfulness about our sin, it just kind of always stuck in my craw whenever I'd hear that. I, it never made sense to me. And so it was just really a blessing to hear you clarify that because I certainly, as you said, can't forget certain things. Even though I've forgiven them, they're still in, in my memory, but they have no power over me anymore on a negative. And yeah, that, that was a real was really relief for me too when I realized that. For sure. Yeah, it's, how can you forget something that, uh, that's involuntary to do? All right. Well, the next session, which we will take up after lunch, uh, will be session three, the pattern of forgiveness. And this is really the, what I would consider the, uh, the heart of this particular class. And it will handle a section of scripture that most people really don't know how to handle that teach on the subject of forgiveness. I've read probably a dozen books on forgiveness. And so far, none of them really address it, except that little pamphlet that I read in the doctor's office. This is where it concentrated. All right. Uh, so we're going to take off uh, an hour for lunch. Is that what the plan is? I think that'll be enough. Okay. All right. Well, God bless. Look forward to seeing everybody back at uh, 1 o'clock. Is that what we're going to do? All right, one o'clock. God bless.